Here on four, it's time for our weekly look at what the papers say. This week, what the papers say is presented by Godfrey Hodgson. Good evening. After the acquittal of Clive Ponting, the well-known leaker, there were some sanguine spirits in Fleet Street who thought we were going to see the end of Section 2 of the Official Secrets Act. That's the one which enables the government to bring criminal charges for mere breaches of confidentiality. But the events of this week suggest that, given the temper of our present masters, we're more likely to see the end of trial by jury. The threat to prosecute Ponting for a second time was only one of several stories demonstrating how Section 2 still restricts the public's access to knowledge. CND, minors under MI5 monitoring. That was the Guardian's splash yesterday, and there was more inside. Kent, Scargill and Gustin, targets of MI5. Two former MI5 intelligence officers alleged last night that leading members of CND and the NUM have had their telephones tapped and that political information about the conduct of strikes has been passed to government in direct contravention of MI5's charter. In the third paragraph, The Guardian revealed the source for this statement. The allegations were made on a documentary made for Channel 4's 2020 vision, which was banned from being screened last night by the IBA. The Guardian reported the substance of the allegations, and only in a secondary way reported that their source was a banned documentary. The Times and the Daily Telegraph saw the story differently. Secrets Act is blamed as IBA halts MI5 film. The very workmanlike report by the Times crime man Stuart Tendler led like this. A Channel 4 programme featuring a named former MI5 officer and allegations of surveillance by the Security Service on Trade Unionists, the National Council for Civil Liberties and CND was prevented from being shown last night by the Independent Broadcasting Authority. The Daily Telegraph put even more of the weight of its story on the banning of the TV programme as opposed to the alleged snooping. IBA bans MI5 phone tap film. Well, the Daily Mail scarcely found the story worthy of its notice at all. Under these two stories... Costly Cuppa! Grand old Teddy. This was the Mail's entire coverage. Channel 4's programme MI5 Secrets was banned from screens last night by the IBA, which said it contravened Section 2 of the Official Secrets Act. The Times, Telegraph and Mail didn't make much of the documentary's serious allegations. They preferred to concentrate principally on the ban. The programme by 2020 Vision would have been deliberately committing a criminal offence under the Official Secrets Act, if shown. The IBA said that the decision had been taken after consultations with counsel. The banning of the programme reveals another dimension to the present Official Secrets mess. Counsel for the IBA gave one opinion, but it wasn't the only legal view. The program makers claim their counsel had advised them that a defence against prosecution under the Official Secrets Act was runnable. So here we have two groups of lawyers in effect acting as censors. One group telling the IBA that the law said it couldn't screen the program, while the other group was telling the production team that it could. That might have been the end of it had Channel 4 not shown the program to a group of MPs. They inclined towards the Guardian's view of the importance of the allegations of phone tapping. MPs fury over phone tapping. MPs angry over claims of MI5 phone tapping. And for the Express, which gave the story only six paragraphs yesterday, it was front page news this morning. MI5 girl in storm over TV phone tap film. A former MI5 officer, Kathy Massiter, was at the centre of a new secrets row last night after accusing the government of tapping the phones of miners' leaders, Arthur Scargill and McMagachie, as well as CND chiefs. If those claims are true, they don't threaten national security. But the trouble with Section 2 is that whether they're true or not, they could still result in criminal charges. Miss Massiter, the Express reported, could face the threat of prosecution because, as an ex-member of the security service, she is bound by the Act's tight restrictions. So, just a week after Ponting's acquittal, the potential of the Official Secrets Act is once again thrown into sharp relief. But this week, yet another story concerning allegations of surveillance broke. Oddly, it was tucked away in the diary columns of both The Guardian and The Times. Crying wolf? Police yesterday began investigating an attempted break-in at the London home and office of Cecil Wolfe, the publisher of a book due out this year on the unsolved murder of 79-year-old anti-nuclear protester Hilda Muddle. Yesterday, Wilt's wife, Jean, found their bathroom window cracked, its metal catch snapped, and dirt in the bath. The Guardian suggested the break-in was a consequence of Mr and Mrs Wolfe's telephone being tapped. The evening before they were burgled, they had agreed over the telephone to publish a book about the murder of Miss Hilda Muddle. The Murrell case is crammed with such coincidences. Whatever the truth about Hilda Murrell, Wolfs, or MI5 phone tapping, 
As long as government shrouds every aspect of its activity in unnecessary secrecy, it's only natural for many people to think it's got a lot to hide. But if the secret workings of government remain underexposed, Fleet Street has more than compensated elsewhere this week. Sun special report on the scourge sweeping Britain. Gay plague seals off death prison. Gay plague kills man at Beeb. The horrible disease AIDS has been known about for several years and written about in a comparatively sober way in the quality papers. The rest of Fleet Street took little notice until this story broke on February the 1st. Gay plague kills priest. The Mirror's headline was more indirect. Boysdale Chaplin dies of AIDS. But its story was a masterpiece of innuendo. A prison chaplain with 200 boys in his care has died of AIDS. Bachelor Gregory Richards, 38, who worked at Chelmsford Jail, Essex, was Britain's 57th victim of the dreaded and incurable gay plague. That was three weeks ago. This week, The Express appeared to be a voice of calm, with this article by a professor of genitourinary medicine. Why we must not panic over AIDS. The professor was reassuring. It must be emphasised that the disease is not spread by coughing, spitting, sitting next to someone, cleaning up after someone, and all the things that one has seen in the last few days. Yes, indeed. But what happened during the past three weeks? There had indeed been a panic, largely created by Fleet Street. And the Daily Express had been as guilty as the others of spreading it. Why even doctors dread killer AIDS. Warning of million cases in Britain. The amazingly high death rate of AIDS disease has struck fear throughout the health service. Doctors expect the tragic toll to double every six months. They expect a million Britons, one in 50 of the population, to contract AIDS if it continues unchecked. And just two days before its don't panic piece, the Express was gaily spreading fear of the disease. AIDS alert. AIDS alert. AIDS alert. Women victims of deadly gay plague. But the Express wasn't the only paper playing that sensationalist game. Three weeks of imaginative, competitive scaremongering reached a climax this week. AIDS death shock at BBC. Take action now. Inside there was more. Ban on deadly kiss of life. Firemen have banned the kiss of life in case they catch the killer disease AIDS. A union chief said yesterday, We believe our men are at risk. I gave even higher marks for ingenuity to the mayor's sister ship, the people. World exclusive. Scandal of AIDS cover up on QE2. Passengers and crew on a QE2 world cruise have been deceived by an astounding cover up. They were kept in the dark about a passenger on board with a killer disease, AIDS. It was the people's intrepid man in Sydney who was the hero of the hour. To his astonishment, he found himself breaking the news of the AIDS scare to flabbergasted passengers and crew. It was the first they had heard of it. The story was only exclusive, of course, to the unfortunate passengers. The news that a homosexual millionaire dying from the syndrome was on board had been widely reported everywhere else. Private Eye had an aptly tasteless cartoon in its regular feature, the gays. QE2, AIDS scare. I always said cruising was dangerous. And the sun didn't lag behind when it came to bad taste. So you think you have problems? Prisoner may have AIDS and syphilis. Another incident which got strangely mixed up in Fleet Street's obsession with AIDS was the death of an old age pensioner in Portsmouth, 78 year old Mr. Sidney Reuter. The Times and the Daily Mail carried straight reports, or rather, versions of the same straight report. Health chiefs last night admitted an unfortunate error in which a pensioner's death was wrongly attributed to AIDS. The Times' story was not bylined. The Mail carried a byline story by someone called Stuart Payne, an apposite name for a medical reporter. He chanced on almost exactly the same words to describe the unfortunate circumstances in Portsmouth as the anonymous news hound at the Times. Health chiefs last night admitted an unfortunate blunder in which a pensioner's death was wrongly attributed to AIDS. Great minds think alike. Both stories went on in strangely similar vein. Wessex Health Authority said there was a regrettable error on the death certificate of Mr. Sidney Reuter, aged 78, a former dock worker. They said there was a regrettable error on the death certificate of former dock worker Mr. Sidney Reuter, 78, who died last Sunday. Here, of course, we catch a glimpse of the work of those unsung heroes of the street, the subs, who in each newsroom lift the same story of the press association wire and take important decisions like whether to call it by Stuart Payne or leave it anonymous. The Express and the Mirror brushed aside the denial and went with more alarmist angles. Health alert for 40 given blood of AIDS victim. 40 people given blood infected by the AIDS virus were being traced last night after the death of a former hospital patient. Pensioner Sidney Reuter, 78, died of the fatal gay plague on Sunday following a transfusion during an operation two years ago, it was claimed. The passive voice, it was claimed, 
can be very useful to journalists as well as to politicians when they don't want to say who's claiming what. The Daily Mirror showed even greater initiative with the most emotive angle of all. AIDS, baby, nightmare. Mum must wait to see if her child will live. A mother was facing the agony last night of knowing she and her newborn baby could die of AIDS. She received diseased blood given by a homosexual donor, and now a 78-year-old man who also received it has died. Ingenious as these efforts were, I don't want to be unjust to the sheer professionalism of the lads at the Sun. Gays put Mrs. Mops in a sweat over AIDS. A theatre's Mrs. Mops want gay actors banned from their stage because they are afraid of catching AIDS. The theatre director took the precaution of issuing the women with rubber gloves and told the Sun. We had a meeting and I explained that you only catch it from sexual contact. And he wins my prize for the quote of the week. The chances of sex between the women cleaners and the actors is remote, to say the least. The next day, the Sun found a new angle. AIDS, the fear grows. Tattooists draw the line at gays. There's an old saying that if you say, don't panic, they panic. It's not, I suppose, that popular newspaper editors actually want a national panic over AIDS. It's more that they just don't care. Anything, anything at all for a good story. What's most sickening is when this recklessness is dressed up as responsible reader service. The Sun republished this helpful advice to undertakers. Safety guide to burying victims. Embalming must not be carried out. Viewing of the body is undesirable, so relatives should be told that there is a risk of infection, and therefore it is better not to view. Pursuing this public service approach, the Sun ran a number of informative pieces. I particularly admired the care taken to avoid the faintest danger of sensationalism or alarming the readers. Twenty things you didn't know about AIDS. It's spreading like wildfire. AIDS, the facts and the fiction. No AIDS cure will be found for four years. Then finally, following the good journalistic rule that every story should be brought home to the reader's own experience. Have you got AIDS? Doctors fear that up to 20,000 Britons may be victims of the rampant gay plague without knowing it. That was too much for one of the few people in the populace who can be relied on to write good sense in good English. The Mirror's Keith Waterhouse. Have you got AIDS? The Sun asked its readers in one of its more entertaining quizzes yesterday. Uh, there were no prizes. We seem to be heading for the same panic over this dreadful plague, AIDS that is, not the Sun, as seized the Americans when they first became aware of it. There was much to panic about, Waterhouse conceded, for those of what he called a certain disposition. But there's nothing to be gained by blunders, cover-ups, or whistling in the dark. In other words, we are handling the crisis in the traditional British way. I have no doubt that when the 17th century Great Plague first struck, the authorities tried to kid the populace that it was a mild epidemic of flu caused by an isolated rat with a streaming cold. There might not seem to be much in common between the Gay Plague and the General Belgrano, but there is. If you live in a society where there are laws designed to stop the public finding out what's really happening, then you get a sloppy press where rumours, innuendo and plain falsehoods are so rife that no one takes anything it says seriously. And that, in turn, makes it easier for our masters to keep us in the ignorance they believe we deserve. Good night.